Muchísimas gracias a, a, a Baltasar Garzón. Thank you so much to Baltasar Garzón and for the foundation for having invited me to be here. Well, I was expecting something more less intimidatory because we'll be doing, well, I have this microphone and then this big screen, so I feel like Bruce Springsteen myself. So I am delighted. I am delighted to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't join you <clears throat> before. So we had the first hearing that was celebrated by the Court of Appeal at the ICC. So the first part of the hearing took place this week, so I could enjoy the conference. Uh, well, from the beginning. So I would like to apologize in advance if I repeat something that has been mentioned before or if I don't go deeper in some of the topics do you expect me to go deeper. So this today, I'd like to discuss with you how international jurisdiction goes into the ICC and the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute does not create on its own an ICC, but an international system of uh, justice system where national states coexist with ICC and where there is a distribution of uh, competencies and powers and where in the good balance, in the good workings of these competencies and powers relies, uh, lies the success or lack of success of failure. So what actually designs the statue of the ICC, it is a mercantile model that uh, states a mission and a purpose where the states create an ICC, but they do not delegate on the ICC the responsibility of prosecuting, but they reinf reinforce their own duty to prosecute international crimes. But they strengthen that promise after uh, with the creation with the creation of the ICC, which is a supranational court. So within this context of the ICC, and what can we say about international jurisdiction? For me to talk about ICC and international universal jurisdiction requires me to uh, recall Christopher Hall. Christopher Hall was the legal advisor of Amnesty International for many years. Well, unfortunately, he died um, in the fight against cancer. At uh, the end, well, he lost that battle. So Christopher Hall was a really remarkable person in the development of the universal jurisdiction. He was a hard fighter, and he fought really hard for the establishment of ICC. And from his, his position in Amnesty International, he achieved the entraining or the consecution of this ICC. He was a hard worker. He could see the system as a system that necessarily had to involve a wide or an ample commitment on the part of states to fight against immunity, impunity. So he was the author of many publications on research. And at a point in time, he said, the model of the ICC is a model of complementarity. The court comes into operation or comes into force whenever the uh, states do not or, or are not willing or cannot intervene. But what is the scope of the action of the ICC? Where is the ICC? What does the what does the ICC should not work? So these are these were the elements that he was really excited about. Well, but here we have to take a couple of steps back. First of all, we should clarify that ICC does not have a universal jurisdiction. It has a basis uh, which is conservative. ICC can only have jurisdiction on crimes committed on the territory of a state party or on crimes committed by nationals of a state party. That is passive and active personality. Another touch point, such as the nationality of the victims, were not enshrined, were not set out within the bylaws. And 
not even in the um, neither on the declaration of the universal jurisdiction. Germany tried to increase the jurisdiction of the ICC, but that it was that was not successful. So therefore, the ICC is based on a limited model. So what? To what is it expected from the ICC? Well, it will not have universal jurisdiction, but we would like it to have like an extended ratification so that that jurisdiction deep inside is kind of extended, so which would be closer and closer to universal jurisdiction. That is to say, there will be a greater number of partners fighting or in the um, try to achieve or uh, exercise universal jurisdiction. But we haven't reached universality yet. And well, I have a friend that says that in 40 or 50 years, this is something that we will achieve. We will achieve a fully universal court in 40 or 50 years. So as I said before, the court, the ICC, in its preamble, reminds states that states have a duty of prosecuting crimes of their jurisdiction. That is to say, crimes against uh, humanity and war crimes. These are the most severe type of international crimes. However, it doesn't say how a state should do that. So, well, we don't know whether the studies are claiming or asking the uh, states to do so. This is a complex question. Some interpretations, uh, optimistic interpretations, point as that the answer is yes. However, this is a bit categorical answer. However, it, but it is true is that the studies of the ICC sets out generous exercise or implementation of universal jurisdiction of national countries. So and then, well, we could say, on the one hand, that should imply compulsive jurisdiction. That is to say, states have a duty to take action, for instance, in the case of violation of Geneva Convention in 1949. There is no doubt that there is a duty to implement jurisdiction, but also the prescriptive one, where the international uh, legal element does not ask uh, states to do it, does not command or instruct the states to do it, but encourages the states to do it. So I think the message on the preamble is correct, because it says we are not imposing any jurisdictional models, but we are demanding states to adopt or to the recipe that is best to fulfill with the Roman statute. In practice, it is interesting to see that ratification of the statute and the adoption of implementation of legislation has led or has placed countries that implement jurisdiction, jurisdiction in a very interesting position. So because if the starting point is the Roman statute, the function of the duty of extraditing or prosecuting, it is just ineligible. So that is. So this is clear, and especially with regard to the ICC. And in my country, that has led to the implementing legislation to recognize the universal jurisdiction. That is to say, we recognize the principle, and that means that if Argentina is not willing to extradite a war criminal or the author of genocide, should implement jurisdiction despite the place where the uh, crime were committed. And this comes from a country that was not a traditionally good friend of universal jurisdiction. So therefore, that has had a catalyst effect. And I think this is relevant. Uh, 
as we are going back to the model of the Roman statute and as well as to the competencies of the ICC, the competencies and the roles and function of ICC are limited for the reasons I gave before, because of its legal basis, because of its material resources, because of its capability to deal with the issues that are taking place, have taken place in different places across the world, or just because it has been created to manage or to deal with the most severe cases within the scenario of international crimes. The ICC, even if it is uh, working uh, at full steam, would, there will always be a gap. There will always be a gap in terms of universal jurisdiction. The ICC contributes a measure of justice. And we, from the Public Prosecutor Office, we will concentrate our efforts so that to encourage that. Well, we have relaxed a bit our initial commitment of only focusing on the higher instances. We have recognized that in some cases we will start more from the bottom and then we will be going up gradually. But as we mentioned before, the prosecutor office will deal with number of cases that that need the further contribution, that need a further contribution to prosecute some crimes. So, and as I said, that will be a limited scope. And then in this case, the impunity gap has to be covered by the national states that are the partners of ICC in the fight against impunity. And the same logic of the principle of complementarity tells us about the importance of universal jurisdiction. Why is that? Well, because in the state where the crimes have been committed, it is a complex state or it is a collapsed state, there is not much that we can expect from that state. That is to say, other states should be there to implement justice. So therefore, that's where jurisdiction, universal jurisdiction becomes the natural partner of the ICC to fight against impunity. So that's why when ICC is presented as an alternative to universal jurisdiction, this is uh, the wrong approach. ICC was not born to disappear the universal jurisdiction, the principle of universal jurisdiction. I wouldn't say that it is false, but I would say that it is not true. ICC was born to complement national jurisdictions on any uh, aspects of active or passive uh, personality, etc. It was born because it was recognized that sometimes national jurisdictions are not enough and they need something else, uh, something that is independent, far away from the places where the crimes were committed, free from political pressures, that has its specific know-how. For those reasons, we need the ICC. It has been conceived for that, but not to displace or to replace the principle of universal jurisdiction nor national courts. There have been some uh, practical examples of uh, having the public, uh, well, the prosecutor's office investigating and prosecuting cases that could fall under the competencies of ICC under the basis of universal jurisdiction. A few years ago, we were investigating uh, a minister from RDR, and then the federal authorities from Germany were investigating people resident in the territory that were commanders of the army. There were contacts between the prosecutor's office and the German prosecutors, and then we could see that the German investigation had made lots of progress, but we could also see that the German public prosecutors were missing lots of things. They didn't have 
persons of contact on site. They were not aware of the situation on site. They didn't have mechanisms to access specific places. Well, they didn't have information about specific sectors. And that we engaged into a cooperation system because and whereby we provided them the specific know-how that they needed for their investigation. And that was a case of the sex. That was a case that was brought to trial. And the perpetrators uh, received a sentence, were con prosecuted for that. So this is the type of cooperation that could take place between the ICC and then the n national states that are also interested in fighting these cases. This would not have been possible if Germany had not included in its law the statute of the ICC in, uh, well, if he had not included within his penal code the principle of universal jurisdiction. And in the light of our experience, what are the limitations that we can anticipate? Limitations that a national state that wants to investigate and to prosecute crimes that fall under the uh, competence of the ICC could have. First of all, I would like to go back to the previous example. First of all, tech, lack of technical capability. And this is something that has been widely discussed. And with that, I mean that it is a fact, uh, a real fact. And unfortunately, sometimes it is the way it is. Sometimes public prosecutors, national public prosecutors, do not have specialized units in uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, and whatever. And if they exist, whenever they exist, more often than not, they do not have available resources to them, or they are just, I don't know, like a graveyard for the oldest public prosecutors, such as has been the case of Argentina. And, and actually, at the end of the day, these units are units that are minor in nature, and they are minor compared to other units such as specialized units such as money laundering, etc. So therefore, if there are no technical capabilities, if there are no resources available for to make it happen, considering that universal jurisdiction has a number of inherent limitations being far away from the place where the crime was committed, lack of contact with the victims, sometimes pressure, pressure that we have in our own territory, or pressure from the people that have been exiled. So if we do not have somehow or some kind of national mechanisms that help us deal with this type of situations, we run in the risk of having testimonial universal or declarative universal jurisdiction only that does not end up in redressing or offering a full reparation to the victims. The second point is that the state implementing universal jurisdiction might find itself in a situation of lack of cooperation. And here we see the paradox that we had between Argentina and Spain, when uh, Justice Garzón was implementing universal jurisdiction, Argentina refused to cooperate. But now Argentina, well, and, and when Argentina wants to prosecute crimes committed in Spain under Franco's regime. Argentina says, I don't want to cooperate. Uh, well, OK, now it is cooperating. OK, OK. Then the second part of the example that I gave it was not correct. Anyway, in this time, uh, this kind of phenomena explain the possible tensions that could happen between states when it comes to universal jurisdiction. And sometimes the ICC could act as the arbitrator. Or, so imagine a situation where a state has custody over the uh, person that is suspected of having committed a crime. And the country says, well, this ex state is, uh, I don't want to cooperate. I'm not going to extradite or to transfer the uh, person suspected. But if the ICC asks me to do so, I will do it. So in that case, deep inside, 
the state that is implemented universal jurisdiction is not in a position to implement universal jurisdiction because it is incapable to do so. Why? Well, because it cannot, it cannot uh, have or cannot make it possible for the person that is accused to appear. Yesterday, the Chamber of Appeal confirmed. Can you hear me better now? The Chamber of Appeal yesterday confirmed that the court, that the uh, the, uh, the case that the ICC is dealing with against the son of Karafi is well is uh, finding the limitation of bringing the person to justice. So sometimes the states are limited and have no other choice but to accept that the ICC is in a better position than itself to carry on with the proceedings. And then another possible problem is the existence of barriers and hindrances to the criminal prosecution that could be opposing or, or, or could, could go against the laws of the country, but not to on the ICC. We have to be very careful with the issue of immunity. There is a possible revival, and well, some efforts are being made somehow to rewrite Article 27 of the Rome Statute. But it is true that there is a failure. We have the ICC and there is a ruling where the ICC has recognized the, the common law principle, but then it says, well, the ICC, it's, a, it's, a, it's different. They are not opposable. So the state parties re renounce or waive their own immunity, and second, they are willing to cooperate, and then cooperate, cooperation prevails over immunity. And then in those cases where there is a remission on the part of the Council of Security, according to Article 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, it also displaces the system of immunities. So it could be the case that a state that wants to implement universal jurisdiction finds itself clashing against this wall, and then they cannot really address the ICC. So what is the lesson that can be learned from all this? And it is a lesson that could help us resolve many problems and resolve many issues regarding impunity. So what is the best way to do so from the viewpoint of fighting impunity? For that, I would like to share with you, well, the our case cooperation with German prosecutors. That's what we said. Well, what is the best forum to bring the perpetrators to justice? In that case, we decided to do it in Germany, and then the ICC supported the German proceedings. Well, perhaps different case. Well, perhaps the ICC will say, well, you are in a better situation okay, than us. Let us you do it. So there should be a dialogue. There should be a dialogue between the prosecutors and the ICC. I also would like to highlight, for instance, a state that is implementing universal jurisdiction and wants the ICC not to intervene on a specific issue, well, it could do so. So once more, I would like to clarify the ICC has not been created to display universal jurisdiction. And then national law, it is as important, it is equal to the justice implemented or offered by the ICC. However, in order to do so, that state should have to fulfill the duty. That this, it will have to prove that that state is investigating and prosecuting the same conduct, the same facts. And yesterday, we got the confirmation that when we are talking about the same fact, the episodes of victimization that the prosecutor are investigating or that underline the accusation that the prosecutors are bringing forward should be substantially the same. 
ones. So, for instance, if my case is made up of massacres one, two, three, four, five, so if we have the state implementing universal jurisdiction, uh, prosecuting only massacre number five, no, it is not in a position to displacement. So, the case should be substantially the same, overlapping. And then, well, this is highly demanding. Well, some uh, states are already complaining about that because they say, well, because you are, are demanding a very technical approach to this element of eligibility. But I think this is correct because that offers lots of legal certainty. So this is for a state that is implementing universal jurisdiction for cases that are have been committed far away from that state that could be a bit of a problem also. And then, so is it possible to imagine a non-sanctioned exercise of universal jurisdiction? Well, there have been some attempts to use universal jurisdiction not as a mechanism of accountability, but as a mechanism of impunity. So, I, well, there was a comedian, an Argentinian comedian, highly popular one, and he talked about Argentina. As a, well, he was a well, wonderful man, and he was all the time improvising, and he had an imaginary character. And he was a Latin American dictator, and then the dictator of Latin American Republican, that his name was Poor Coast. And then, well, this place was always in war. So imagine that Gaddafi travels to poor coasts. Or imagine that General Rodriguez, after receiving international pressure, sets up a system to prosecute Gaddafi. And then at the end of the day, it is, he is acquitted. That could happen. So. The Rome Statute has mechanisms in place to deal with these kinds of risks. First of all, national conviction is valid. And second, the, second, the sentence does not have the force of the judge thing. Or the, yes, the, so, well, there are a number of mechanisms in place to deal with this risk. This is not a severe risk, but to my surprise, I've seen like two or three times from this happening or some attempts on the part of some states to create these elements or to do these kinds of imaginative things in order to remove some jurisdiction from us. Going back to Christopher Hall and uh, to his memory, as I was thinking about this presentation and I read some things that he wrote, I kind of realized why he was so much related to universal jurisdiction. He was a person who was deeply moral person. He did the right thing. He was very demanding, not tolerant. Well, he had, he was highly, highly ethical person. Uh, I have always respected him a lot. He has always been, he was also a difficult person, like a bit inconvenient, and that caused lots of problems for him, and also problems coming from people, people within some types of these organizations who were more laid back. So universal jurisdiction also obliges us to have a moral superiority, to go into a superior plane where real politics should not play a role. So it is a plane where we really want to offer justice for the victims. We should, no matter where the crime has been committed. So it is our awareness, our so it's good conscience. It is moral superiority. So it is inconvenient. It is inconvenient. Well, it causes uh, co inconveniences and uh, tensions, and it also generates political problems. Uh, political problems. But Chris Hall was a necessary person, and universal jurisdiction, as same as Chris Hall, 
well, we had all these problems, but it, they, both, they were both equally necessary. Thank you so much, and I finish my presentation on this point. Fabricio. Thank you very much, Fabricio. There are a few questions in the room. First one. What's your opinion about the initiative that it's undergoing in Latin America, specifically at UN, UN South, after Chirigoga's initiative in Salvador? To have it, uh, to have a prosecution, prosecutor's office in uh, in in court in 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 Latin America or at the very least in Salvador, is it utopia? Do you think it will contribute or to the Rome Statute? Is it feasible? Is it not? I don't have an answer, and I have to say that I'm giving just my own opinion. I'm not here representing any kind of an institution, right, with this answer. I firmly believe in the need to have integration and to have joint bodies and institutions, and we need to have national prosecutor networks so that they coordinate their efforts in their struggle against impunity. Having more structures created, I'm not sure about that, and I have to say so. There are initiatives to have an African court, an international African criminal court in place, which I don't think will materialize. And there are many more things involved here because the court is putting forward cases against heads of the state. That's what, what was the original reason. In abstract terms, not much that I can say. I tend to enforce this in a different way. I think we have clear system. Having intermediate bodies or statutes, I don't think it is a bad idea, but I think the national institution should be strengthened, and we need to strengthen as well the coordination within and in uh, between states. There's been a good initiative in Europe, which is this prosecutor network or exchange groups for the prevention and punishment of war crimes and crimes against humanity, which is working out because it's given way to lots of information and also this is a cooperation network that could be very useful. I would rather focus on those kinds of initiatives, but this is just my personal take. The prosecutor office at the ICC develops a preemptive or pre-trial investigations in different countries. They are doing so in different countries right now. One of those countries is Honduras. The question would be, an eventual termination or conclusion of these pre-trial investigations in a situation such as the one in Honduras, do you think it would mean that institutional violence and other kinds of violence would be further instead there is no investigation in Honduras, in Honduras from the ICC actually the prosecutor's office as before starting an investigation they carry out an assessment, a preliminary assessment. Uh, this has been the case in Colombia for several years. We are very active there. We go to Colombia, we have debates and discussions with authorities, and we keep an eye in prosecutions. We are materialized there. We are a material presence, tangible presence. But that's it, because in any case, we've seen how the national domestic system is dealing with cases. There are some demands, some requests, some targets, and then we do monitor them. As for Honduras, the situation is similar. It is preliminary analysis or assessment. Then, uh, uh, if the assessment is concluded, then ICC is out of the question. It's, it means 
that there was no need for an investigation according to our assessment, but if there are any new events, then the cases are reopened. Now we've reopened the preliminary analysis or assessment in Iraq for crimes which allegedly have been committed by breaches commanders according to new information that's been referred to us. So, in this regard, I do not identify a problem. In your opinion, what's the best option for the future in order to guarantee universal justice? ICC, national courts, international courts, both. both. I don't know if you're familiar with the amendments to the law on jurisdiction, universal jurisdiction in Spain. And in the preamble and some other places in this amendment, there's a reference to the ICC. Actually, there is this preference of investigation or prosecution of the ICC. Do you think that's the case? In reality, it is, is it the other way around? The principle of complementarity says that it is up to the country to try and investigate first. Or should it be the other way around, as it is suggested in our new amendment? Well, I think somehow I've already answered this question in, in my presentation. The system that creates the Rome, created sorry, by the Rome Statute is a system where there is a cohabitation, coexistence of national authorities that carry ahead cases together with this ICC. So there is no preference, no prevalence. The only thing, the only target with the system would be to prevent simultaneous proceedings being issued before the ICC and before domestic courts. But there is no prevalence, there is no preeminence. And I've said so before. According to the Estatute, states are supposed to take upon themselves their duty to enforce jurisdiction. This is a question for you and for all other prosecutors working at the ICC. You, as prosecutors working at the ICC, have you ever come across any situation where you've seen interference from a powerful state in the ICC? Are they completely independent? Yes, we, we are. No, independence, influence? No, no, we are independent. We are fully independent. Actually, truth be said, I know it's difficult. I've been working as an international prosecutor for 15 years, working first with former Yugoslavia and then with Rwanda and respective uh, courts uh, for the ICC. There's no interference there. All, all state parties have their concerns. They say what their concerns are. They ask about it. And of course, we take care of their claims. And, and that's it. There's been no interference, no kind of interference, because the prosecutor's office is independent. But our hierarchy, or chart flow, means that the estate that doesn't want to be investigated, uh, well, they can stay out of the system. They do not ratify. You can bomb a state party, but if you are non-state party, no problem there. Same happens with the inter-American system of human rights. What about the US? What about Canada? They only go into litigation uh, part of human rights. That's the only thing they accept. So the Institute says that there's no need for further safeguards, and so there's no need uh, for interference. And there's a question about the genocide of the Sahrawi people. This situation followed here in Spain. Could it end up in the ICC because of the lack of cooperation from Spain? Meaning, not, not the facts from the past, but actually the eventual acts that could be committed now were Morocco is the offending country perpetrating genocide against the Sahrawi 
um, people, if, if there is a jurisdictional basis for that, yes, but I cannot say much more. Something else, taking into account the challenges of the ICC to set a balance which needs to be fair between right to a fair trial for the defendant and also respect for victims, how can we make sure that we find a balance, the very same balance, when enforcing universal justice, taking into account that there is not an evenness enforcement, uh, an even enforcement of all domestic courts, because we're talking about different countries, we're talking about different legal bases and, and systems, and so they are all different in their nature. It is a complicated question. I think first approach would be, uh, this is the case for transnational criminality such as terrorism, organized crime, offenses uh, affecting several countries. In that regard, I think it is unavoidable somehow. The fact that different states that have different legal systems face the very same offense in a different way and following different methods. There's something that I consider is important. For example, 30 years ago, talking about harassment, this was kind of an offense uh, that was not profiled, was not defined. What now, after 25 years of universal jurisprudence, where we are criminalizing uh, the crimes in the Rome Statute and we have many more international treaties and we know what harassment is, what the elements are, and who is the perpetrator, what liabilities are involved, questions which years ago seem, uh, seem far away, seem very remote and fictitious, or fictional, sorry. So, what's the meaning? Well, it is meaningful now, and there are many things that can be used now. For example, in Colombia, they are pioneers in using international case law for uh, litigations, national lit litigations. In Argentina, I've seen several uh, federal cases uh, using rulings from Granda and from other places in one ruling, uh, cases from Argentina, Yugoslavia, uh, um, Rwanda. I think 30 years ago the situation was a bit more shocking and pressing. Uh, nowadays, of course, there will be a few cases that go off the roof, but generally speaking, we are in a much more um, for, forecastable, or foreseeable uh, future, sorry. The Rome Statute and the Universal Jurisdiction has not been used for, uh, for crimes against humanity, but Schillinger, for example, has been tried according to this Universal Jurisdiction and convicted for crimes against humanity. Covite has lodged a claim back in February, February it seems it says in here, last February, the on crimes against humanity committed by a terrorist organization in Spain, ETA. What's the case law that they use for an, a pre-trial assessment? Do they use evidence or do they use the criterion of complementarity of the crime? Of, of the country of commission. Well, during the first stage of assessment, we see whether the facts that are being referred are follow under the scope of the ICC. If those acts clearly, are clearly outside the scope of the ICC, whether because it is personal, territorial, or, or for time reasons, I think if they happen before the entry into force of the institute, then they are not considered. If the, during the first stage this follows under the scope of the ICC, we see if the different uh, states are taking things into account and see as well if the crimes are serious enough to be prosecuted by the ICC. There's this other question that I feel that you've already answered but still there are some countries that when cooperating with ICC uh, ICC's law prevails over their own domestic universal jurisdiction how is this compatible with Rome statute 
I guess they're asking about complementarity. I, I, I'm not sure this is the case in any state, but what we've seen is that some states would rather we manage their problems. This one, for example. I'm not saying anything. Well, that's what law says. So, well, I'm from Argentina, so I don't have a take here. But Spain is, is party to, to the court. But as a public official, I cannot give my opinion either. doesn't matter where this comes from, I cannot answer. Well, that's what I asked you in a previous question. Still, still, well, this is something that it has been discussed. What's, what's prevailing here? St statute, domestic law, international law? And this is my adding. This is domestic law, which, according to the cooperation law from 2003, Spain and ICC, is adapted only for universal jurisdiction. I think that's what the question is about. In the case of universal jurisdiction, yeah. I think the question. And state with universal jurisdiction, that takes universal jurisdiction, when they have a victim claiming justice, they should never say, go to The Hague and see what happens. That's not what the system was created for. It was created for those cases where the states stay on the front line in the fight against impunity and that fight for justice. And if the states cannot or will not do so, and if they will not, means that there is some connection with the facts, that's when the ICC comes into working into place, into seeing. And there was a third party, and that is the lack of activity in the state. Those cases where the state would rather not take an action and have us take an action. And so the ICC has given its support because our Court of Appeals said, when I think of the legibility of a case, I need to see if the case itself is being put forward by domestic authorities. If there is no activity, I don't mind if the state can't or won't. If there is no activity, if there is no proceeding, then it is eligible to be prosecuted at the ICC. Taking this into account, there are many victims that call us and say, we would rather have you deal with this. Naturally, the court somehow well has its neutrality because of its location, the fact that that was its main purpose when it was created. Well, it is clear. So, let's talk about sexual violence in Uganda. I send it to the court, and so I can focus on the next case, on manslaughter. And, and, and yet, to some extent, that uh, falls under our scope. Uh, it would be kind of a repository for those cases that are very difficult to put forward by domestic authorities, but cannot be the standard that, that um, states are giving up. Is it clear? Well, taking into account that you could not take uh, the question, uh, you did it pretty well. We'll see about tomorrow, what happens to me tomorrow. This one you can take it, I, I guess, because it has nothing to do with scope of the ICC or anything like that. So I think it's just a legal opinion. Obligation to prosecute or extradite. Sylvia Curia, a, a judge from Argentina, has requested distribution of two alleged perpetrators from Franco's regime, which is something refused by Spain, but there is no excuse to that. Do you have any consequence, any solution? What's, uh, what's left for Spain now? Spain has not rejected it, but yeah, not, n not prosecuting, not uh, extraditing either. At impunitate. If this was to happen today, for those crimes that fall under the scope of the court, this would be somehow seen as an attack on the duties uh, set out on, on the statute. Uh, we wouldn't have any doubt. But even if there was interstate conflict, you could argue 
There is a given incompatibility between that stance and the duty taken upon every state as a state party to the universal justice system set out by the Rome Institute to fight against impunity, working with other countries or putting forward a case within the nation. Rome said its system won't accept those states where there is international crimes and they decide not to do anything when they have the capability to do something. This is a piece of information. Uh, the fact that this uh, federal Argentinian judge is here in Spain these days, and that's what I said before, that she's here, right here, right now. As for cooperation that was requested through a letter of, re a letter of request, and the Ministry of Justice uh, sent it to the court, involved court, and part of the courts, I don't know if all of them, and I guess this will be mentioned tomorrow by, by Carlos Slipoy. Well, and, and those courts have uh, accepted to deal with, with the request. And now there is an impending request for, for larger cooperation in this regard. But again, extradition is not being granted and uh, criminals have, been, have not been prosecuted either. Thank you very much. We will now move to the next panel. Thank you very much for your question and uh, questions, uh, answers and presentations. Thank you very much.